Welcome to the Designing Music Now podcast, a podcast dedicated to the craft of creating music for video games and interactive media. I'm your host, Dale Crowley. Today, I will be speaking with composer and audio director, Jim Bonney. you to rapture i suppose you could say i work in debt collection well you got a name miss you can call me elizabeth this world values children not childhood where's sally there's a profit to be made and men who make it i'm taking you to one of them who are you what they would do with a child in a place like this. Don't get too comfortable. Someone's coming! Beauty and pain. They can be no more separated than birth and blood. No, no, no. No, 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 no. This is right. No. Sally! Okay, well, welcome to Designing Music Now podcast. Today, our guest is Jim Bonney, the audio director and composer who worked on Bioshock Infinite, uh, Metal, uh, Mortal Kombat, uh, Armageddon, and uh, a number of other incredible video games in his career. So, uh, Jim, would you please introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm a I'm composer and audio director, and uh, my company is called Big Loud Sound. And uh, mostly we do uh, music. We also do sound design and VO for video games. And your new game is Perception, which was a Kickstarter game. Yeah, one of one of several projects I'm working on right now. But yeah, Perception with uh, Bill Gardner from Bioshock Infinite Days. Well, we'll get into that pretty soon here. Um, but first of all, how did you get started in music? Um, you know, music was kind of a thing that was always around my house. Um, my my mom is a very fine pianist and uh, organist, and she would be an accompanist at church and with choral groups. And my dad um, is. He played uh, p- trumpet and dance bands when he was in like high school, and then mm-hmm. he got into the folk revival in the '60s, and he was you know playing bars and and um, coffee houses and stuff um, mm. with you know guitar and singing, and uh, and he's just a very natural musician. He he can pick up pretty much any instrument and just start to play it after a few seconds. Wow, uh, amazing ear, yeah. And, but music was and music was always in my house. I mean, there was always music playing, um, and people were playing it. People would come over and there'd be jam sessions at my house and stuff. Um, but it was never something taken too seriously. It was, hmm. um, and it was a real mishmash. It, it, there was no difference between like my dad's Waylon Jennings records or my mom's, you know, Bach, you know, inventions that she was practicing. Wow. Um, it, it, it all was just music and it didn't matter whether it was a hootenanny or it was, <laughs> you know, a, a classical concert. There was no distinction in my house. So, uh, it was kind of, an, I, I took it for granted really, um, growing up that way, but music was always around. I started taking guitar lessons when I was about um, nine mm-hmm. um, with a, a woman named Hope Varner, who was a former cowgirl who'd been on, you know, on tour with like Roy Rogers or something like that. Um, you know, I learned all my chords on, on four, four strings and I'd taken piano lessons before that, but 
really didn't take it very seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, I played the trumpet in the seventh grade, mm. um, and I uh, I played really really loud, so they made me first trumpet. But <laughs> I only learned five notes, so and I couldn't really meet, read music. And and once the teacher kind of figured out that I would only play the five notes and skip all the rest of the notes, um, that got busted down a third trumpet, and that was kind of the end of my <laughs> my organized music experience as you know in ensembles and stuff. So. Um, it was all kind of a mishmash growing up and, and just um, t- listening to everything. And the thing that really lit me up was when I was, I guess, like 13 years old, I heard, and this is going to date me now, hmm. uh, I heard Van Halen 1984. I went over to my friend's house. He's mm-hmm. like, you got to hear this. And he put this record on, and um, it was the whole album completely blew my mind. Yep. But uh, it was Drop Dead Legs where I was just like, that, that is amazing. Just the groove, and it just felt so good. And I, w- I remember walking home thinking, well, if Eddie Van Halen can do it, why can't I? And that's really when I started to practice and take music seriously and, you know, take an interest in music theory and, and, hmm. and take the time and devote the time to, to actually try and do this seriously. And where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up all over the place. I was born hmm. in Boston and we moved about every year and a half on average uh, mm-hmm. until I finished high school. Um, and we lived overseas for quite a while. Hmm. Uh, I did high school in Greece. Oh, wow. I, also lived, I also lived in Cairo, Egypt. I actually heard the Van Halen album in, in Egypt. And, um, oh, and I also lived in Saudi Arabia. And it was, it was kind of also, that was kind of part of my musical experience too, was mm-hmm. hearing um, these indigenous musics in these different places that we live. Um, again, like odd time signatures or odd scales. And this was not anything mm. particularly odd. This was, this was the music that everyone just listened to. And so there was no stigma or, or categorization going on inside of those things. Plus, there was all this pirating going on of, mm. of cassette <laughs> tapes back then. Um, so you could buy a ridiculous amount of music mm-hmm. for very cheap. So if I wanted to experiment, I mean, back then it wasn't like go online and, you know, rip stuff, rip stuff or, you know, get a no. you know Spotify account or whatever. Um, you actually had to have the music. And uh, but I could I could try things out. I could listen to different things. Um, and it was not it was possible to do that with my meager allowance. Fantastic. Yeah, what are it was your- cool. What are your earliest memories with music? You know, I think the one that sticks out to me the most was, I remember um, it was an orchestral recording on, and I don't remember what it was, um, but I remember my dad pointing out, like, you hear that? Like, that's an oboe. Right, right. And, he, and he'd be like, now listen to what the oboe is doing. And then he'd be like, now later on, listen for the oboe, listen for what that oboe is doing. Mm-hmm. And he would point out, he was pointing out different instruments, and have me listening kind of into the sound. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't remember how old I was, but it was something that I always kind of was in the back of my mind that like, you know, if I'm listening to something and it was, I, it was just, I could always listen down into the sound. Right, right. And figure out what was going on. Yeah, I totally remember that with Peter and the Wolf was uh, yeah. one of the classical music pieces that played a lot in my house. And so, uh-huh. you know, being able to identify not only the instrument, but also the, the animal along with it. So that yep, was yep, pretty yep. awesome. Yeah, it may have yeah. even been Peter the Wolf because there was definitely that was definitely a recording that got heavy rotation as a kid. Right. What other kind of music was played? Uh, you said all kinds, but uh, yeah. was there jazz as well as all the other stuff? Yeah, there was jazz. My dad was in the Dave Brubeck. Um, right. Me Wayland. too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you know, I remember Lothlonious Monk. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, my uh, he was into Waylon Jennings and uh, mm-hmm. Willie Nelson. Mm-hmm. He had very eclectic tastes, um, and it was great to kind of have that as an influence. Excellent. Um, yeah. And my mom was more in, in, into classical music. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was kind of getting different styles from different different sides. Right. Plus all the Middle Eastern music that you heard, I think, really uh, expanded your, you know, your in your formative years, mm-hmm. what what was possible with music and, you know, what I think the vo- the basic vocabulary. It's almost like learning a language when you have all those additional um, scales, like you said, and rhythms and also styles because they're the harmonies are different. It's mostly melodic instead of harmonic in those things, right? In those yeah, def- music. definitely. Yeah. And also, you know, the music I was getting into, like, I mean, I was a big metalhead in, you know, mm-hmm. junior high and, and high school. And I would, I would read the magazines, you know, like Circus Magazine and Hit Parade and stuff like this. Mm-hmm. And uh, it would, uh, they would interview these bands and they'd be like, okay, well, I, I was in Iron Maiden. So if I read a review with Iron Maiden, they'd be talking about, well, we were really influenced by Black Sabbath mm-hmm. and Cream. And right. so I would go and find Black Sabbath and Cream recordings and listen to them. Mm-hmm. And I'd find stuff written by them. And they'd be like, well, we were really influenced 
by Robert, I mean, by Jimi Hendrix, you know what I mean? So I'd listen to Hendrix. And mm-hmm. Hendrix would be like, well, I was really influenced by, I don't know, Robert Johnson. But I would take these recordings back and, and, and listen to kind of where historically they were coming from. You know, in, in the other direction, maybe it was King Crimson. Well, that's, you know, taking a lot of influence from minimalist music. Mm. Uh, I remember, I mean, I remember going to, to, to a mm. Philip Glass concert and walking out and going like, I don't understand what the hell that was. <laughs> that was, that was not cool. But, <laughs> but at the same time, I was trying it out at least, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. I mean, I feel a little differently about Philip Glass now, but um, right. there are other minimalists I prefer better, but you know. Yeah, no, I, I think that kind of music really, you have to throw away any preconception that you have mm-hmm. and realize that in, it's influenced by its time and its place. And, you know, if you go back to Mozart, uh, I was just in Vienna. So in there, you can see why he was influenced in writing the music that he was writing because the, the Rococo style was so freely. It was mm-hmm. so, you know, so decorative. And mm-hmm. so all of the mordants and the trills and everything that he added to the music Mm-hmm. You know, they the started off with sort of more Baroque style with Bach that was very, very staid and solid. And then you take those columns and you start adding uh, the frilliness to it in Mozart. Mm-hmm. And so and then then you get to Philip Glass or Schoenberg or uh, Steve Horowitz, who's on our team. <laughs> you know, he uh-huh. writes uh, stuff that's in the, in the modern classical, uh, contemporary classical style. And you really have to throw away any preconception you have of music <laughs> uh-huh. when you listen to it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Great. So um, now changing gears a little bit, if you could have a conversation with anyone, living or dead, who would that be? Um, I think, well, it would depend on the day, but because on some days it would be like Leo Tolstoy, who mm. I think was an amazing artist who didn't lose his sense of humanity. I mm-hmm. mean, when Gandhi is looking to you for advice about how to, how to think about your approach to life and how to, and how to, to approach a peace movement and things like that. Mm-hmm. Clearly, you've 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 tapped into something, and I think as artists, we can we can become quite narcissistic, and quite um, self centered. Um, mm. But Tolstoy seemed to have a, a great sense of the whole world and not just himself. Uh, on the other hand, there are other days where I think I would really just like to hang out with Hunter S. Thompson or or uh, mm. Jimi Hendrix. You know, not so much because they would necessarily be imparting great wisdom, but because um, they'd probably be a hell of a story afterwards. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. it'd be a great story to tell. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so what would you ask Tolstoy? Um, I, I think, I, I, I don't know what to ask. I would, I would mostly want to just listen. Mm. Um, I, I don't, I think there probably would just be wisdom in, in, in shadowing him for a day practically, you know I mean? Right. Um, because I think that what I was describing is something that I, I struggle with myself. Uh, is finding that balance. So, um, I, I don't know. What Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I think you would. You're absolutely spot on. Just listening to someone like that, following yeah. them around for a day, and yeah. gathering, you know, what it is that made them as humble and as brilliant as they were. So, yeah, yeah, excellent. yeah. I'm not even sure I'm wise enough to ask the right questions. You know. So. <laughs> well, that's the beginning of wisdom for sure. <laughs> so uh, now, what is your favorite video game? Um, of all time. Yeah, let's go with all time. Okay, I mean, I think it's tough. I think it would be Journey. Mm. Uh, the biggest reason, if I was to, to, to give it one one thing, it would be because at the end of that game, I remember watching the the role where it said all the people that had helped me on my journey and playing the game. Mm. And I, I felt so like such a warm feeling from that. Mm-hmm. And then all I wanted to do was start the game over and play it again. I remember right. that too. And there's, that so rarely happens uh, right. for me is that, oh, I just want to play the game over again. Um, and, I, and I really just wanted to experience the whole thing over again. Um, well, and it plus, was, it's, it, it was, go ahead. I was just going to say, it didn't take you to a base place. You know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with like blowing stuff up and shooting stuff. Mm-hmm. But to it, Journey never gave you those verbs. And you also never really felt like, Boy, I really want to do something, you know, primal and reptilian to this, <laughs> to whatever, right. whatever's around me. You know what I mean? Like it was mm-hmm. an, kind of an uplifting feeling, and, and I thought that was an amazing achievement. So the graphics, of course, were beautiful. But what mm-hmm. role do you think that Austin Wintry's score in that game gave you that same sense of peace and uh, peacefulness? Yeah, I mean, his score is is phenomenal. I would put it mm-hmm. in the top three, you know, video game scores. And and what he, I think, what he did with interactivity, uh, especially for the time period. Um, was was you know forward thinking, mm-hmm. so it was a fantastic score, beautiful beautiful score. 
So would you say that would be your most memorable experience with music and playing a video game or was there another one? Probably um, because, you know, I find to, a lot of times I end up turning off the music and it's, and that's a terrible thing to say. It's not that I don't like the music. I can even think of one game and I, I don't think I'm going to name it, but it has a, a, a good score and it has a good, excellent composer that wrote the score. But there was so much sound going on that once I turned off the score, I was like, oh, okay, now I can enjoy this game, you know? And there's other things where it gets too repetitive or any number of things. I think that writing for, you know, a non-linear experience is a very, very challenging thing to do musically. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that you need sensitivity all the way across. You need it from the, the composer to the audio director or whoever's doing the mix, the final summation of things, to the, the designer, the game designer themselves. Um, right, because you can very quickly end up with just an incredible bombardment of noise that's just exhausting or unnecessary. Absolutely, and so let's yeah. talk about perception at this point because it, it, it dovetails into what you just said about your design for the music. As you said, uh, I remember reading that you said you want to get in as late as possible and out as soon as possible. Yeah, and do I as think little as possible, and also that's harder than doing more. So yeah, uh, let's talk about that, but let's also talk about the game itself so for people that might be unfamiliar with Perception. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so let's start with the game. So Perception is uh, a game where you play as a blind woman who has been drawn to this haunted house. And the only way that she can, the only way you as the player can see is by having her tap her cane or make some other noise in the space. And then it, and it becomes kind of like an echolocation style way of viewing the world um, and the the trick so she's trying to unravel why was I drawn to this house and what's going on and she's also trying to escape because she can't get out um, and at the same time there's a bit of a cat and mouse going on because there's a ghost in the house that is tracking her and for every noise she makes the ghost is drawn closer to her so it becomes this uh, cat and mouse pac-man kind of experience where you have to evade this ghost I see it in my dreams Night after night, the same house. A thousand sketches, a million hours of research, and finally, I found it. The estate at Echo Bluff. To do this. I'm at the door. See you soon. Okay, now why am I here? Hello? Probably should have worked out a plan if someone is, you know, here. What was that? The pipes. That's gonna throw me off. Well, I'm pretty good with a wrench. Come on, house. Show me what you got. I'm gonna have to take the scenic route. Have you come to play? Oh, hell no.
could have been worse. Hello? No, what do you want from me? So what was the inspiration for that game? And who, who came up with the ideas? Um, well, it's Bill's, Bill Gardner's concept. And, and I remember him coming to me very early. And it was a really good, strong elevator pitch. Hmm. Um, you know, it was one of those things where he could get the point across in, you know, 25 words or so. Wow. Uh, and not only could I imagine the game, but I could imagine the sound and I could imagine it being a cool experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and so immediately, beside the fact that it was Bill and he's a good cat, I wanted to work on this game because it was a, it was a very solid concept. Now, from that stage to get it to a Kickstarter campaign and then to get it be a successful Kickstarter campaign, what had to happen? What step? Um, uh, the biggest thing, I guess, would be representing, you know, Bill's concept somehow that we could clearly demonstrate it to the, to, to the audience. Um, and so it became a bit of a vertical slice, I suppose, or introduction. I don't know. Vertical slice, uh, in video games is where you, you basically fill out the entire experience for a very short period of the experience mm -hmm. so that, um, it's kind of proves out like what it's going to sound like, what it's going to look like, what are your missions going to be like? And, and in a very short amount of time, you have a sense of, of what that all is going to be. So did um, you produce the trailer before the funding or did that come oh, out? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. okay. So that's that was the core vertical yeah, size. Th yeah. That was all that was all like done on faith, really mostly on Bill's part. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the rest of us also were were taking some risk, but I mean Bill was really laying it out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, and the process of doing a Kickstarter campaign should not be um, underestimated. I uh, I mean I I put in some all nighters to to help get keep the keep the flame alive while we, mm -hmm. we try to promote the thing. But I mean, Bill, I know, and his wife just completely threw themselves into this thing fully. And I, I think it just devoured them for 30 days. You know, that was mm -hmm. all they did, uh, you know, around the clock was promote this thing. And so what's different working on a Kickstarter game than say working uh, with uh, Bioshock Infinite, a big team with a huge budget? Um, well, it's, uh, it's tremendously different. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, the biggest thing I would say about out of being out of house, uh, and working with like Bill on, on perception is that, um, everything matters. Uh, and, and if an input needs to be given, it's a small team. Um, and if you're not contributing everything you can, you don't want to ever sit back and just be like, well, okay, you know, they want to get that. That's cool. If you think that there, if you have qualms about something, you need to speak up because um, if this game isn't good, everyone fails. Mm -hmm. um, and not to say that uh, it's not the same thing with with uh, AAA, but AAA the teams are bigger, the project is usually has a bigger scope. There are more more you know fingers in the pie. You know you've got the you've got the, pr the publisher getting involved in a lot of cases. You've got um, a lot more disciplines with a lot of a lot bigger teams uh, mm -hmm. being involved. So no. it's um, a lot more. Condensed and intense, I would say, with the uh, out of house experience. Indeed. But is it also more freeing in some ways? Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I mean, you can, you know, you you, it's and it's more honest in a way. You know, I mean, you, you have to have some there are come to Jesus moments, you know, on a regular <laughs> basis that go both directions. You know, right. Um, and and also, um, well, I mean, I'll say at least anecdotally in this experience, you know, Bill has been extremely open to. Um, things I want to try and things I want to I want to see if they'll work and you know sometimes they do and sometimes they don't but he's he's cool with the idea of like all right well let's let's see what you come up with and we'll go from there so so you're the audio director does that mean you're also mm -hmm. doing the sound and the composing or are you yeah. working with others in that at this point I'm I'm doing all the sound design and the music and the VO yeah so wow fantastic yeah yeah <laughs> it's pretty massive <laughs> yeah I can imagine <laughs> it's pretty massive um but uh, it's nice also because I, I know what is going on with those other disciplines. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not stepping on my VO with my music cue and I'm not uh, creating sound effects that don't gel with, you know, Excellent. the yeah. VO or, you know, I mean like every, every all the, the three disciplines of mute of audio are, are kind of working together because it's only one person huh, with a cool. huge ego who's getting it all done. So. <laughs> well, I, I don't think you have a huge ego, but <laughs> um, 
So is this being built in Unity, and are you using any middleware? We're uh, we're in UE4, mm -hmm. and oh, we are great. in we are in the process of um, negotiating um, different middleware solutions. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the music composition that I uh, alluded to earlier, which is to be uh, uh, come in as late as possible, leave as soon as possible, and also your the orchestration. Uh, you didn't want to go with a full orchestra. Yeah. You wanted to do some. That was one of your limits. So uh -huh. talk about the music and how you've approached that. Well, the concept of of like getting in getting in late and coming out early is I I, I lifted from somebody. I, I used to live in Los Angeles and and was. Uh, an aspiring film composer mm -hmm. and uh, listened to a lot of very wise, very experienced uh, composers. And I, it was either Hans Zimmer or Mark Isham or both mm -hmm. who said that, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's, I think it, I think it works. It's a, it's a rule that tends to work well. Mm -hmm. um, the less that you push with the music, often the better things turn out and the more, the more gentle of a touch. Yeah. Um, you begin to say too much and, and you begin to not only, I think, draw away from, from the picture, but you also um, say less, right? With what you're doing, um, and the the choice for orchestra. I mean, I mean, look, I'll be honest; it's partially financial, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But the other reason was that I thought that there was a really cool opportunity to to kind of go back to a style of um, media presentation, like Albert, like Alfred Hitchcock and mm -hmm. Bernard Herrmann, right? And and look at you know like the more eclectic ensemble that becomes this very unique sound. And a unique voice for the uh, for the for the media, mm -hmm. in their case a movie, in our case a video game, um, and and modernize it. I mean, it, it's not it's not stri a strictly uh, acoustic ensemble like most of Bernard Herrmann's scores, mm -hmm. but it it is kind of trying to work in a more uh, chamber music kind of style. And what type of instrumentation are you planning? And uh, will it be anything in the box as well? Will you be using some synthesizers and so on? Um, I. So I reserve the right to change my mind, but yes, I'm thinking, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at this point, I'm thinking it's going to be a flute and probably, you know, alto flute, bass flute, mm -hmm. um, cello, mm -hmm. uh, probably have some percussion, but I'm probably not going to use standard uh, instruments. Mm -hmm. I probably use like right now I'm using um, a giant fan, uh, like an oversized uh, uh, industrial fan. Yeah. Uh, a lot of uh, samples of that, uh, or large pieces of metal. There's there's one thing I did with a bunch of bowed metal and mm. and hit metal, um, and then a lot of the score is being filled out with right now is being filled out with um, processed electric guitars. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I'm kind of using the guitars like a synthesizer. I mean, the guitar is basically my oscillator, right? But um, I but I like the the organic quality of a string that's starting out this this oscillation that then gets mm -hmm. processed. Um, to sound like something else. Well, and I like your choice of flute too, because it can it portray so many different emotions. If the, mm -hmm. especially the bass flute, where you've got the really somber tones, and then you can go from that to the higher registers, and then you can get different emotions from that. And and it's so human mm -hmm. in its uh, expression. Well, and I'm, and and along those lines, you know, I'm not thinking about this in terms of light motifs, but I am thinking about the fact that the this is one person, Cassie, mm -hmm. who's go her, her name the blind woman's name right. is Cassie one woman going into this house it's a very uh human scale story it's not over the top mm -hmm. super giant space marines and stuff like this <laughs> um and it, it, she's alone and it's about loneliness and so there's something i think that's very evocative and expressive and also lonely about the sound of the flute mm. and and sticking to that um simplicity i think it's going to be expressive in in getting across some of her experience Excellent. And it, this game does remind me a little bit uh, in seeing the trailer of Gone Home, which I just really loved. Mm -hmm. um, do you ha plan to have any diegetic elements of music in the game or is it going to be all non-diegetic? Oh, no, 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 no. Definitely. Mm. Definitely diegetic stuff. Awesome. Uh, I got some very cool plans for diegetic stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so one of the things I'm doing is I've got a, a theme uh, that is actually based on a, I'd say poem, I guess, written mm. by the writer, Amanda Gardner. Uh, and uh, I set her, her, this poem, it's like a, kind of like a, a curse mm. that, uh, that I've set to music. And using that melody, I'm going to be doing, I mean, there'll, there'll be other diegetic music, but 
there's um, this theme is getting pulled into the underscore. It's going to get pulled into the music in the world. Nice. And it's going to be kind of this pervasive thing, kind of like Twisted Nerve, the, mm. which is a Bernard Herrmann score, yep. uh, where that where this whist, this whistling theme kind of ends up all over the place. Nice. And uh, it becomes very pungent in terms of, of giving an audio signature to that film and hopefully to this game. Well, I'm look, really, really looking forward to this game. Cool. Uh, so who's your favorite composer, Jim? Uh, um, I think it would probably be Igor Stravinsky. Nice. He's just such a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and he started and he all just, this mess. <laughs> well, he's, yeah, that and, and he, you can just like when you start looking at the scores, you're like, oh, you, you devious bastard. Like he, 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 it's like he's writing jokes almost. They're like mm -hmm. practical jokes on, on people inside of the score. It's, it's yeah. kind of amazing that way. And I also love the fact that like he didn't like he had his success and then he kept evolving. You know, I think mm -hmm. there's so few artists that, that keep challenging themselves to grow and whether it was. Uh, you know, su successful or, or uh, appreciated or not, he kept challenging himself to, to create something new and different. And I think that's really amazing. Fantastic. And who would be your least favorite composer? You know, uh, uh, I don't really have a least favorite composer. If I, if I don't like something, I, I, I kind of try and come back to it later. Hmm. The only thing I can say is um, I, I don't like Coldplay. I, I... <laughs> I just can't. And, and there's people I know that like, like they like them, and and I, and I respect these people, you know, and mm -hmm. I respect them musically, and I just don't get it, man. I mean, those guys. Not a fan. Not a fan of Coldplay. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, we. Yeah, I won't uh, give you my, my <laughs> feedback there too. I will just kind of. Uh, I, I wish them all tacitly success. Tacitly agree. <laughs> yeah, you know, I wish them all success, and I'm glad that there are people that get something out of it. I, I don't. I, there's nothing there for me. Yeah. I don't get it. Um, so what is your favorite instrument? Uh, I love the guitar. Mm. I, it just, you know, I took years of piano lessons. Uh, I've dabbled with the trumpet, like I mentioned. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, <laughs> I've played some flutes. You know, I, I've, I've tried to, to you know, work on percussion traps. And the, the instrument that just kind of feels good when I play it is the guitar. I just love anything with frets, really. Uh, banjo, mandolin as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just love that instrument. Excellent. And do you have a least favorite? Um, uh, I don't tend to like digital synthesis. Hmm. Uh, it's a necessary evil at times if it's a sound I'm trying to, that I need to, to achieve. But um, I tend to find it extremely cold and dead. Mm -hmm. uh, and analog synthesis is different. Right. But um, the digital stuff, uh, like plugins and things like this, just really always come off yeah, kind of cold and dead to me. So really anywhere that I can avoid... Um, using it, <laughs> I do. The reason I disappeared so. for a minute. Have you seen the new Moog? Or Moog? Oh yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, this is the uh, System Fifty Five modular synth. Uh huh. Wow. Yeah. That's a beast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I haven't gotten into the modular synth thing myself. Yeah. I, I because mainly because I think it's a slippery slope. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and <I'm laughs> which really you'll worried. never return. Exactly. I'll just yeah. I'll just be you know twiddling knobs and and mm -hmm. buying new 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 gear. Um, so I haven't. Yeah, uh, it really dipped my toe with that, but it's cool stuff. Yeah, at AES last year, they had on display the one that they're selling for about 250000 the original Moog. Uh, oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, that was pretty fascinating. I, I asked who their clients were, and they couldn't say. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, that uh, should be interesting, too. Yeah, and I so, love playing with that stuff, you know, but... Right, uh, but, but you're okay with that. Stuff. It's the, the digital stuff. Uh, we're talking DX7? Or <laughs> oh no! Well, I mean, yeah, I guess so. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking more like, I, you know, here I go making more enemies, but you know, besides <laughs> Coldplay, uh, Omnisphere or Abs, uh, Absinth, yeah, yeah, um, you know, Massive. I mean, I'll I'll flip the lid on these and and like I'll tweak stuff out when I need to, mm -hmm. but it's not a it's not a sound that I personally um, reach for right away. Excellent, or or really at all. Right. <laughs> it's only out of necessity. Okay. So and so, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Um, I always said that if I flunked out of music school, I was going to be, go to a cooking school. Oh. Um, and I do like, I like, I like food. <laughs> food food <laughs> yeah, is good. Food is good. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, I suppose that maybe a chef, but man, that's a, that's a tough lifestyle, you know, it's mm. a, it's a, a kind of dedication. I think probably like being a musician where it's just, you just got to be all in, you know? Mm -hmm. So my hat is off to the cooks and chefs of the world and so I enjoy my amateur status. Yeah. Great. Uh, so, Jim, what was your first major break, your first big project, meeting with an established composer or something like that that got you into the industry? 
Well, I mean, I've had a lot of I've had a lot of lucky breaks, and um, I've I've just been super lucky. Um, but uh, I, I think the the one that sticks out in my mind is uh, I'd been living in Los Angeles, and I uh, had just quit working on a a major uh, television series as a ghostwriter mm -hmm. for writing music. Oh, nice! And I had to leave because they were screwing me over. They were taking my royalties. Uh, mm. They were paying me half as much as they had said they would pay me, and they were saying you can come back and write for us anytime. Mm. And I just had, I had to leave because I, you know, it was just not going to work out, and I was financially running out of money, and so it was kind of a really challenging time. And I'd gone home to visit my folks, and I lay over in Chicago, and my plane got delayed, and I called a buddy of mine, um, and I said, "Hey, man, I got it. I'm extended. I'm stuck at O'Hare," and he's like, "I'll be right out." And uh, this friend of mine's name is Rich Carl. Uh, he's the audio director at Nether Realm, which used to be uh, Midway Games, mm -hmm. and he'd been my roommate in college. And he came out, and he we hung out, we ate at Chili's at, at the O'Hare Airport, <laughs> 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 and uh, and talked. And I said, "Man, I just I don't know this Los Angeles thing is is really rough." And he's like, "Well, look, I know that these guys across the street are hiring. They're looking for an in-house composer, um, and they're called they were called Williams, and they used to make mm -hmm. pinball machines, and now they were called WMS Gaming. Now they make slot machines." He's like, if you send me a demo, I'll walk you through the door. At least you know that they're going to hear it. So I, I put together a demo, which was easy because, I mean, of course, in Los Angeles, I'm sending out a bajillion demos all the time. And uh, he, he took it over, and I got an interview, and I went out to Chicago, and I ended up getting the gig and being an uh, in-house composer for WMS Gaming for a couple of years, uh, which was really my first break into interactivity and, um, I would say, nonlinear composition. Mm -hmm. And of course, they got bought by Midway, right? Or they became Midway? No, they used to be with Midway. They split. Oh, okay. So it used to be Williams Midway Valley, and they all split. Interesting. But yeah. then you began to work with Midway as well. Yeah. So point. after a couple of years at Williams, uh, sorry, WMS, <laughs> um, uh, I had the there was an opening at uh, Midway, and uh, I man, I worked so hard to get a demo together that I thought they would like, and uh, I knew all the guys, but they they you know they wanted to, this was a serious role and, and I know I was competing against other people but I did manage to get the gig uh, and that's how I transitioned from slot machines to video games interesting and that's yeah. where you worked on uh, Mortal Kombat Armageddon Mortal Kombat Armageddon and I also worked on uh, John Woo Presents Stranglehold right great game. and yeah and I, I helped out some with Blitz the League and Ballers and like any the cool thing about the Midway team was that there was a, a bunch of guys and a bunch of them were leads um, and a bunch of them were also musicians and composers and whatever, there was always one lead on a project, but the other guys would all work to help them. And you were incentivized mm -hmm. to help them as well as you could because later on you were going to be the lead and they were going to be supporting you. Mm. So you wanted to help. It became this really good synergistic situation where everybody was really working uh, in everyone's best interest because it, was, it all came back around to you. Mm -hmm. And did you do the music and some sound design there too? Yeah. Um, I, I, I wrote music for uh, Stranglehold and Armageddon. Um, and I did some sound design. Um, I didn't do any VO while I was there. Mm -hmm. um, well, I did the voice of Sub Zero, but other than that, uh, and nice. only, his gr only his grunts. I like. I didn't do his lines. I was. Like, one, I was going to ask you about that. that. Was he a did real a lot of actor? Mm. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I'll tell you, man, that's really hard. Uh, Chase yeah. Ashbaker produced all those, and uh, it was like sixty characters in that game. And he's like, dude, this is like the roughest gig I've ever had in terms of like <laughs> all day long. People yeah. are yelling at me. Yeah. And getting in there and doing it is, is hard, too. There was, like, I think 115 cues. And I remember by the end of it, I had this just absolutely horrible headache. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't feel my feet. Like, <laughs> my feet had gone numb from, yeah. like, channeling all this energy. Just go, mm -hmm. rah, rah, you know, and so this yep. over and over again. Super exhausting. One guy I know threw up. <laughs> <laughs> he, like, he, he, he was, like, doing, hu, hu, hold on a second. <laughs> Blows lunch. And then he kept going. That's All right, okay. let's go. It's a wrap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he just he threw up into a garbage can and then just kept on doing the lines. Oh man! So, but it's you. You just take it's yeah. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. But be sure to have your vomit bucket on hand. Exactly. Barf bag. Yeah. Uh, nearby. Interesting. Very cool. And then how did you get uh, to begin to work with uh, Bioshock and their team? Well, I I kind of saw the writing on the wall for for Midway and I started looking around. Mm -hmm. Um and other options, and uh, Bioshock had just shipped, and they were looking for a new audio director, um, and I applied, and, and uh, I got the gig. 
Wow. Awesome. Yeah. It's, awesome. it's the only gig that I didn't actually know anybody there. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was kind of interesting that way too. And you actually composed uh, some of the music in that, as well as worked mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Gary Shiner, mm -hmm. and also I guess uh, Ken Levine on that. So, yeah, Ken wrote some lyrics, and like yeah. we'd set those. And uh, Duncan Watt did a bunch of stuff. And then, right. you know, when we did the the what we called um, faux period music, um, mm -hmm. like we worked with uh, Scott Bradley from the Postmodern Jukebox on that. Right. Um, and um, uh, there was. Clay Hine, who's a great uh, barbershop quartet arranger. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some fantastic musicians to work with. Well, you, uh, won but, an, uh, yeah, yeah. you won a number of awards for that, uh, mm -hmm. as well as for the licensing, which I do think was brilliant, the licensing. Were you involved with the licensing part of it oh, as yeah. well? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, I, you know, we, every song, it, it, some, some of them, like Ken would be like, hey, man, we should, I think we should do this. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, okay, well, let's figure that out. Uh, and then other things, it would be like, all right, let's 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 find something that we – I can get kind of excited about and I would, you know, make it, put it in the game and pitch it to him and see what mm -hmm. he thought. Now I found the music to be very different between Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite in terms of its style and feel and everything else. Uh, Gary was still involved, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and I loved how you brought like some diegetic elements of the piano from the initial Bioshock theme that became how you were able to control the bird, for example, mm -hmm. and, and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, what was, I mean, you're obviously your inspiration for the music was based on the, the world, the game world itself. Yeah, 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 yeah. But what caused you to choose the instruments that you chose and things like that? Why Why did you pick those? Um, you mean for the underscore? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's an orchestral score. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a reduced uh, ensemble. Right. It's, it was a much smaller size ensemble. The idea being to kind of think more intimately about about um, this character relationship and and uh, there's a there's an intimacy when you start to to pare down the instruments so that you mm -hmm. can kind of hear what what each person's doing rather than having a mass of them uh, presenting this kind of huge onslaught of sound and 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 infinite was such a big game and such a big like kind of over the top presentation to kind of bring the music back to something that was more um, reduced mm -hmm. uh, gave it gave it some some soul i mean i think right. Gary put a ton of soul into that game yeah uh and then from a from in the, like the combat music and stuff like that it was just to get to a really primal um it not it was like this ritualistic primal kind of place you know where you, you take these sophisticated instruments mm -hmm. and you know you begin to just really kind of uh, try and express raw Right. energy you almost torture the instruments in a way yeah to, yeah. yeah 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 to get that frenetic sense yeah mm -hmm. but i guess i was referring more to the uh the cut scenes and those mm -hmm. that, that were scored more with like the accordions and the sort of uh it seemed to me some scottish influence and things like that was that intentional um i think uh, okay so i i, I it, you know it was Every scene was treated uniquely, and and mm. so I think, for example, the one I think you're referring to is when you come across Elizabeth and, and she's dancing on the on the pier, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we needed to find a kind of a style of music that would would be time time period uh, would make sense for the time period would mm -hmm. it make sense for the location as much right. as any city in the sky makes any <laughs> sense at all, um, and we pitched uh, I, I pitched a lot of different uh, approaches for what we could do musically for mm -hmm. dance music there. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, the one that stuck was this, was this style of, um, a dance that, uh, I'm not remembering the name of it right now, but it, it's, um, it's, it's based like the, the precursor to square dancing. Okay. Um, and, um, like it's not, not a, bluegrass, but it's the kind of, no, no. not bluegrass. No. It's a, it's a, and it does come from a, from a Celtic, uh, right. tradition. I guess that's the sense that I was getting Scottish yeah. Celtic sort of. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah. sure. For yeah. sure. Um, and it just fit the scene and it, it, it felt right, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so we got, we got some players in the studio and, and recreated a uh, traditional, uh, dance tune. Beautiful. Well, brilliant score and congratulations Thanks. on all the awards that that game has garnered. Thanks. Um, so what is your composing process? Do you write it? Do you write out notes? Do you play, sit down and play and record? Uh, do you write into DAW using MIDI? What, what's your, uh, process? Um, it depends what I'm writing. If mm -hmm. it's something that I'm, I know that I'm going to finish uh, inside the DAW, then I'll start working on the producing the tracks uh, right in there and, and just kind of keep layering and replacing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if it's something that I know is ultimately going to be performed um, by a live ensemble, um, then typically what I do is I sketch in into a sequencer, um, and I don't usually pull up the sounds of the actual instruments. I usually just pull up a, a basic piano patch or something like this, right. and I'll focus mostly on just the, the notes themselves. Mm -hmm. And I can hear the or orchestration in my head, mm. but I won't dial down on it too long because um, – I want to focus on just coming up with really good notes. If the notes are good, then orchestration is just going to take it one step higher. It's easy to fix things with orchestration. Excellent. And um, so the, after that, I, I then go to the orchestration stage. And at that point, I usually end up going to paper and a pencil, like super old school. Uh, and then I can see it in front of me. I can I can put more pages in front of me. And I, it, mm -hmm. that tactile period of time is, is very helpful for me before I end up you know putting in the Sibelius you know, so that it put on the stands. Right. And so where did you learn orchestration and how to take it from the notes uh, that you've created in a DAW to the page so that uh, players can actually perform it? Um, well, it's a, it's a really good question. So in undergrad, I was a classical guitar and audio recording major, double mm -hmm. major, and I didn't take any conducting or orchestration or anything like that. So when I started getting interested in composition, um, I got into a program, a master's program at Cleveland State University because I was yeah. living in Cleveland at the time. Okay. And um, it was great. I, and I was supposed to take all these master's levels courses, but instead I just went and took all these undergrad courses in orchestration and conducting all the things <laughs> I had learned. Yeah. Uh, and then I went to USC to do the film scoring program. Right. And that was a great, there, it, there was some really good teaching being done, but mainly what it was, was an opportunity to put your scores in front of live players and like mm -hmm. figure out, figure out your mistakes. Yeah. Um, and um so it was a real trial, trial by fire that way. So, I, I mean, I've read a lot of books. I've looked at a lot of scores. My job while I was in Cleveland was, was as an editor, for mm. mostly for classical music, but I also did jazz and blues records. Okay. But the classical albums, I mean, I would be looking at these scores, and I'd be studying these scores to do these edits. Um, um, so it's, I think I'm largely self I am largely self-taught. I've never really had a good composition lesson in my life. Um, well, just but, tons of experience, and that's really where yeah, it's at. That's just what it, I hear over and over. You just doing it is how you, you just learn. Just do it, yeah, and you yeah. learn that, like you know what sounds good and what doesn't. I've also heard a good tip where if you're lis listening to a score of some classical piece, to just follow along with the score and Absolutely. and you know get the score in front of you and see what how they've written it out and so on. So I think that's really good advice. Yeah. Okay. The so, other thing I find that's really good, sorry, super fast, is um if if you take a small section of the score and just start start re notating it like on a grand staff. Mm -hmm. So, you're, you know, so that you see, like, well, how are they spelling out the stacks and what are they doing with the, the spelling of these chords? Mm. So that you begin to see how you get that texture. Right. I think it's super useful as well. Very cool. Besides learning all of the markings and everything. So, well, yeah, definitely. Yeah, as, as a base. Yeah. Um, great. So uh, let's say looking back on your career, is there one thing that you would have done differently that uh, others might be able to learn from? Well, my, my my path was super nonlinear, and I mean, I didn't I didn't get to to um, to interactive games until quite late. I, but I, I think the best thing I would say maybe is like like take risks and 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 don't, and be fearless. You know what I mean? Like mm. play with those musicians that are better than you that are going to make you feel yeah. like a chump. But yeah. man, you're going to learn. You know what I mean? <laughs> and take and take that that music that you you jotted down, and you're not even sure if you did the transpositions right, and have somebody play it. You know what I mean? Like really take really take risks excellent uh, advice yeah. in, in the in the in the hope of learning you know and, and growing and, right. and refining your craft okay and um what advice would you have for composers who are looking to get into composing music for video games um i would definitely look for uh chances to work with teams uh on on you know like indie indie games i mean right, I, I, don't, right. I think that trying to go after triple a studios and triple a games is a bit of a of a folly because there are a lot of guys who got agents and well represented represented and they're out there doing it and uh just sending cold you know cold sending your you know link to your mm -hmm. mp3s or whatever yeah you can't be offended if someone doesn't listen to it because they've got they've got a lot to do and they've got a lot going on mm -hmm. um so I look for those indie teams that need help because they also may be making something super killer and awesome. And uh, I think most of the, there's a lot of innovation going on in that space anyway. So take advantage of it. Yep. Great advice. Um, let's see. 
when do you find yourself most creative? Um, I, I make the best decisions in the morning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I can be very decisive in the morning. <laughs> I'm not necessarily uh, uh, creative, but decisive. So if like if I need to be like just kind of getting getting something downfield and, and, and finished, uh, the morning is very effective. Mm-hmm. If I need to just be kind of coming up with something whole, you know, whole cloth new ideas, then late, late, late at night mm. uh, tends to be where I, I, I have the most ideas. But what I find is that the next morning I need that distillation process, that editor that goes, no, that idea is crap. Uh, Cause you know, there's a lot of really bad ideas <laughs> that I come up with. So, and they, they need to be stopped. Yeah, isn't that amazing? I mean, you can play something and just be so in love with it while you're doing it and come back the next morning and say, what the heck was I right. thinking? <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it seemed like absolutely. it was so spot on, perfect for the cue, perfect for whatever, and it's like, uh, no, I don't think they're going to like that. <laughs> yeah, but so, what, works yeah. For me, what works for me is the, the kernel that was there, then usually I can draw, I can work on in the next morning and be like, okay, well, yep. now I, well, instead of this, we'll just go in this direction with it. Right. Often the mistake is what leads to the success later. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally. um, so when do you find yourself most happy in music? In music? Yeah. Or uh, in life? Uh, well, I, I, in life, I would probably say it's not doing music. <laughs> because, I mean, as much as I, I love music, I really yeah. do. And, and, uh, and it's really all I really want to do. But at the same time, uh, it's not fun because it's hard. Yeah. You have yeah. to challenge yourself, and and that makes it not fun. It's, uh, it was I can't remember who the quote was by, but it's uh, I don't like writing, but I like having written. Yes, and yes. Uh, that right. I find is very true. So uh, once things are finished, that makes me happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. also I mean, seeing my children, you know, do things like you know, first time they come down a ski slope, you know, wow, like yeah. it's such a proud moment, or or you know, seeing them enjoy something for the first time that you've kind of forgotten how enjoyable that is that's mm-hmm. that's a pretty exciting thing to empathically enjoy um yeah music's hard <laughs> yeah. definitely and uh, yeah I, I think i totally hear that a lot from artists and so on is that they're often relieved when they can take a break from it for a while you know yeah and there's that that moment of ah you know i can i can put this down for a bit <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah yeah um so you, go ahead i was just saying you're, and you're glad to take it back up again i mean obviously oh. Yeah, you it's know, yeah, but it doesn't make it easy. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. that uh, just a, a week or two break sometimes can really refresh the uh, the creative juices. Which leads to my next question: Are there any particular things that you do to get your creative juices flowing? Well, okay, so while I was at USC, uh, one of my teachers was Elmer Bernstein, which oh. was an amazing and fantastic experience to be able to study with him. Mm-hmm. Um, but one, but someone asked him once, like, how can you write so much music? And uh, he said, you never get, never let yourself get stuck. Mm-hmm. He's like, if you find yourself even having a hint of, be, or if you find yourself getting stuck at all, you need to get up and do something else. Mm. You know, he's like, I'll jump up. I'll go vacuum the floor and I'll come back. <laughs> Anything. He's like, but, but you never get stuck. You never let yourself get stuck. Mm. Um, because I, th- and I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, it, it, creativity is, is just kind of allowing things to be possible and, 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 putting one thing in front of another thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the editor comes later and, and like yeah. decides what shouldn't be there anymore. Yeah. But um, creatively, yeah, I think not just not letting yourself get stuck. Right. Being a you conduit know? more than a, uh, the, you know, the, the being the instrument of whatever's coming in a sense. Is yes. that kind of what you're saying? Yes. Letting yes, that and, and, and not, yeah. not saying, oh, well, it, you know, if I just torture myself by sitting here yeah. and going, oh, thinking yeah. deep thoughts and, you know, three hours later, you're still like, Mm-hmm. not that's not when it gets sounding really bad when you yeah. come back to listen to it later right yeah right yeah yeah um so what kind of recording gear and uh what kind of what do you have in your studio what do you uh use to you know record on a daily basis uh my rig is pretty simple uh and i i really just i'm just adding on to it as i need things mm-hmm. um i have uh i my daw of choice these days is actually uh ableton live Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Um, and, awesome. um, mm-hmm. I have a, I have a lot of plugins, although I try and avoid them uh, mm-hmm. for kind of the finished product. Um, I have a lot of guitars <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and I, I have a lot of processing, you know, outboard, like, you know, p- pedals and stuff like this. And, mm-hmm. uh, then, you know, the plugins as well to, to process that stuff. Um, I also have a, so all that stuff's on my Mac mm-hmm. and then I have a PC 
that um, is kind of where I do all my implementation and things like that. So I got okay. UE4 and Unity and Wise and all that stuff on there. Um, and maybe eventually right. I will combine it all into one machine. But right now I'm, I'm kind of liking that my Mac kind of becomes this kind of creative content type machine and the other one becomes my more left brain. Implementation. Get it yeah. into the game. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, those are some pretty awesome guitars behind you. Do you care to oh, thanks, do you talk about them a little bit or explain yeah, where you sure. got those? Um, yeah. So uh, this is a... This is a national uh, resonator guitar. Okay. Uh, it's a Delphi model and uh, just got a really, really, really bluesy sound. Uh, sounds great with a slide. Uh, this is a baritone guitar. Okay. So it actually goes down, like most guitars go down to an E. Uh, this one goes down to an A. Wow. Uh, and I built this one myself. So that's why the pickups are, the pickup setup is so weird. Awesome. With the, the PAF in the, in the uh, neck and the uh, lipstick single coil in the bridge and only one volume knob. I mean, it's, this mm -hmm. is not a normal Strat setup. It, it, because the uh, strings are longer, is that how you get to the A? Yeah, the, the scale is a lot longer. Yeah. Cool. So it feels oh, I see you've got not, more frets, too. Yeah, well, uh, well, it's the same number of frets. It's 24 frets. Oh, okay. So it's like an extended fretboard for a guitar. Um, but, the, but the scale is a little longer. It's not quite a bass guitar. You're not, like, you know, out here. Yeah. But you're, you're farther out, and things are, are, are spread a little wider. But it's got a really great low sound. Uh, I've did, used it for, like, low, like, gent metal type stuff, as well as... Uh, for some bluesier things. And did you have to calculate where each of those notes would be based on the string length? Because it's a different length than normal strings, or? Well, I, I didn't. I didn't build the neck from scratch. I bought okay. the neck, and okay. assembled it. So yeah, I'm, not, right. I'm not that good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's got bass guitar here. Yeah. Uh, and then this is a this I got at a uh, uh, like a used music store. Okay. And um, th it was like this. It had the the sticker on it, and it was missing. There's a pick guard that's supposed to be here that's missing, and there's something supposed to be on the headstock that's missing. And it turns out that it's actually it's a um, it's a Japanese guitar made when they were still hand making guitars in the seventies, and it's it's really great. It has a lot of attitude, um, and it, it sounds surprisingly good. And I got it for like one hundred twenty five bucks as far as this. Amazing! So it was a it was a cool find, and it's got a lot of like I said, it's got a lot of, a lot of um, yeah, it's balls. badass. Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> badass. Okay, so the and last I, question. There's other ones in cases here and there. Yeah. And, so. Great. So last question, uh, what, how important is it to understand audio middleware such as FMOD, WISE, and Elias? I think it's really important. I mean, and I think, I think especially if you're thinking forward about your career, um, you do yourself a disservice by thinking that you can just kind of create content and worry about somebody else putting it in. It's not so much important, I think, that you know or that you're putting the stuff in. And granted, I have a bit of a skewed opinion of this because I come from being in-house and Mm -hmm. uh, and doing implementation and things like this, but to get into the mindset of of what, how you're thinking about reacting to things right. um, that the other parts of the team are working on, um, and um, being able to to instruct and 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 be part of the process of of um, deciding how the game is going to be sounded up. Mm -hmm. um, you can't do that if you don't know how to use this gear, and I'm not and not just wise and. FMOD and stuff, but also, you know, UE4 or Unity. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you don't necessarily have to be able to design a level, but do you understand about DSP and do you understand about, uh, you know, ray tracing and all these other things that, you know, um, may be going on under the hood right. that you could tap into if you knew how to, to, do, to do implementation. Wonderful. Um, now, is there, so is there anything else that you'd like to talk about in terms of your current projects and things like that that you're working on? Yeah, there is, but I can't. Oh, <laughs> darn. I, Too soon. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. It, like, I think soon uh, I will be able to talk about these other projects, and they're, they're cool projects, and, and I'm excited to talk about them. But, um, you know, part of the thing about video games is that they take a long time to make, and yeah. um, they try and keep things under wraps as long as they can, and, and I, I don't think I can talk about the other oh, stuff I'm that's... working on, which just sucks, but, um, you know, stay yeah. tuned. Now, you, I saw on your site you also have worked for NASA. What did you do for NASA? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, when I first started writing music, I would work with choreographers. Okay. Um, oh, that's right. You did uh, sound effects for film and theater. I did that too. Yes, yeah. that was that was early on. That's and then theater. I started writing. When I first started writing music, I was writing music for choreographers, mm -hmm. um, like in modern dance and things. And one of them I made friends with was a woman named Sarah Morrison, mm -hmm. who started working with NASA on this project, um, where she was in like a zero gravity kind of rig that allowed her to move based on different gravities the moon wow uh, i think mars 
Um, and and it was it was this whole rig, and, and I think she was actually turned sideways in the room so that mm-hmm. it would function. Um, and they said, "Well, we'd like you to choreograph what you would do with these different gravities." That's so cool. she yeah, it was really cool. And so she did this, and they filmed it, and she did it all with music that had already been recorded. Like I think that she did the, uh, the police walking on the moon mm-hmm. for her moon <laughs> thing, <laughs> and then NASA said, "Great, let's 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 release this film." And she was like. I don't have the rights to any of this music. Yeah, twenty five thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, can you yeah. imagine? Yeah. Like, and yeah. all these tunes, I, I can't remember the other ones that were on there, but like all of it was like well known music. Yeah, David Bowie music. comes to mind. Yeah, something <laughs> I, I can't remember, but uh, okay. Major Tom. <laughs> right, right, right. No, that wasn't it, but that yeah. would have been good. Yeah. <laughs> so, so she called me up, and it'd been years since we'd really talked, but she was like, "Can we? Can you like kind of reverse?" score this and so i did um tempo maps of mm-hmm. these tunes because i mean you'd be surprised that uh walking on the moon is not exactly metronomic you know oh. but i needed to be with her beats yeah you know what i mean and so I, I did tempo maps to kind of line up where these these tunes were and then i kind of went through and watched her choreography without once i had the tempo map mm-hmm. um i would watch her choreography and figure out where i wanted significant events to happen right and then i kind of reverse scored the whole thing wow is that available and, somewhere uh, I don't know. I uh, I don't know. Okay. It was part of a it was part of a film festival, um, quite a while ago, and I don't know whether it's online or not. Okay. Well, we'll we'll look for it, and uh, if we okay. find it, we'll put links in the description. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim, thank you so very much for your time. We really appreciate you having on the having you on the Designing Music Now advisory board. Your uh, help is tremendously uh, appreciated, and thank you so much for this interview. It was really amazing. Thanks, Dale. It was good talking to you, man. Talk to you soon. Bye, Bye. Thank you for listening to the Designing Music Now podcast, a podcast dedicated to the craft of creating music for video games and interactive media. Please visit us at designingmusicnow.com for more info, news, and reviews on this subject. We would love to hear from you.